Spotify. So let's uh, resume the lecture. So, in this last part, we will turn this combinatorial result in something which is more analytical and allow you, as I promised, with your computer to compute first spectrum. And then, if time allow, I will talk about the eigen uh, the outliers. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the first problem of estimating the eigenvalue density. Here is a three-step receipt. In French, first, as I uh, announced, made the replacement of the complex number by diagonal matrices. And I will show in action how to do that on the normalized trace by the diagonal operator. Then you write your favorite fixed point equation, the one presented by Mark Potter yesterday, like the right, the fixed point equation. You take your fixed point equations that has been uh, presented by Mark Potter with this replacement, and then you enjoy because uh, it's done. But, uh, don't forget this last step. So let me show in action what we do. Let's consider, I will restrict to this case, uh, the question of the sum of two matrices. Actually, in free probability, if you want to compute uh, the spectrum of a polynomial in matrices, there is a linearization trick which allows you to, resume, to reduce the problem for a sum of matrices. This is extremely powerful. In classical probability, if you want to compute the density of a function of independent random variable, there is not such a trick. If you have a function or a polynomial in independent variable, and you want to understand what is the density of this function and uh, compute it with a computer, it will be difficult. But for random matrices or free variables, there is this magic. I'm not presenting this aspect, but it is actually the same receipt of another replacement on the amalgamation. For, the For a rational function, it works as well. And then what is another non-commutative function? I don't know, but yeah, you can do that for, if you have a, if uh, your expression involves uh, inversions, don't worry, it will work as well. And if you look at uh, Mingo Spicer books, you have all the receipts. Again, it's amalgamation over uh, a good algebra. So let's just focus on this. Uh, aspect, but don't uh, think that it is just uh, focusing on a single, uh, very tiny problem. It will solve uh, all the problem you want. Okay, so first, let me remind what happened when we are in the case of application of freeness. That is, we assume that xn, yn are independent. One of the matrices is a unitary line invariant. Or one of the matrices is a Wigner matrix. It's not unitary invariant, but it is asymptotically free. Is unita really invariant? Then, assuming that the matrices are bounded, there is an asymptotic subordination property. Is that denoting the Stilges transform G of, um, let's say, uh, an arbitrary matrix A n? is the expectation of the normalized trace of the resolvent. Lambda, identity minus a n minus one, 
as you know, we also need the air transform, which has an implicit definition. And this is like this. The Stilges transform of An equals lambda minus the air transform in the Stilges transform. Minus one. So the air transform is a unique analytic map defined on some domain, I'm not going to specify, which make this fixed point equation characterizing the Stilges transform. So if you are able to know what is the air transform of An, you can solve this fixed point equation and you will be able to compute the Stilges transform. Then, and this is a theorem of Riculis Cousy subordination property with this definition, which are for generic matrices. Or it should be for the limit uh, for number variables, but let's say uh, we, we define it like this. The Stilges transform of the sum of these two matrices, Xn plus Yn, in a parameter lambda, in the large n limit, it will be very close to the Stilges transform of Yn applied in lambda minus, there is no identity, minus the air transform of X apply to the Stilges transform of the sum. So is it correct? So you have a fixed point equation for the quantity of interest involving two ingredients in a non-symmetric way. That is the Stilges transform of this guy and the air transform of this guy. I have chosen to write this equation. There are other characterizations, like the air transform of the sum is the sum of air transform. But I, I like this one because usually there is one model for which uh, uh, we have uh, the we, we know the air transform, but the other one is an arbitrary data. So we treat it like this. Okay, let's imagine we do that. And if you know no air transforms, there is also a fixed point equation just involving a Cauchy transform. Okay, so let's uh, apply the recipe and see what happens for not three elements, but three over the diagonal. So we take independent elements. We assume that one matrix is, is permutation invariant, possibly with a variance profile in the sense that I defined. So is a variance profile permutation invariant matrix. So I, I refer to the second part of the section to, for this definition. You just take a permutation in your matrix. So what I will do is that I will define new objects using this rule. G of A n now will be a diagonal matrix because we make this replacement. It was a complex number, now it's a diagonal matrix. The parameter lambda, I will change the notation by putting a big lambda since now lambda is a diagonal matrix. And we assume that the imaginary part of the diagonal element is positive to ensure that there is no uh, uh, singularity. So we are not taking the expectation of the normal trace, but the delta. And the delta without expectation, this is important. Here, there is a complex parameter. We replace it by lambda. And this is done. So the Stilges transform over the diagonal, the name of this guy, is just the diagonal of the generalized resolvent. Generalized in the sense that here it's not a scalar matrix, but that's it. Then you define the air transform over the diagonal. I will keep the same symbol because it's already a, a, an uppercase symbol, but it's solution of the same equation with the replacement. big G and big lambda. And then it's done. We have the subordination property over the diagonal, which is true in the large n limit, 
in some sense that I'm not going to specify because it's a, a bit uh, technical to talk about this. But if you have written your algorithm uh, on your computer for the classical case, it won't be uh, painful to just adapt, just be painful for your computer, because now the fixed point equation is about diagonal matrices. So you have much more computation to do, but you know that you can do that. Okay, so the diagonal of the linear high resolvent of the sum is the diagonal resolvent of yn applied to this function. And that's it. And if you do that uh, for matrix models, so I will try to show you a picture. So where is it? Here it is. So I don't know if online uh, you can see it. So I should uh, do something. Here it is. So uh, can I zoom? So in this picture, there are several uh, matrix models. So uh, there are the name of the matrix model. I refer to the article if you want to see that. Uh, in the left hand side, we have uh, here a mat a Jiri matrices with variance profile. On the right hand side, here we have a Bernoulli matrix or a permutation matrix, which is symmetrized. And I have, there are three information in each graph. The true histogram of a random matrix that we sample. This is a light blue histogram. We have a blue curve that fits very well this density. And this is what is done with this uh, algorithm. In the blue line, it is a spectrum of an operator, which will be very the, the sum of two free elements over the diagonal. For finite matrices, they are not exactly free over the diagonal. It's just asymptotic. But I, as you can see, I don't remember what is the size of matrices uh, on this simulation, but it was made with simple uh, computer, so it's not a uh, huge, huge, and it fits quite uh, very well, especially in cases where the spectrum is very singular. We see that the approximation is not bad. Here we have some singularities, and it, they are already uh, considered by the blue line. What is the red line? It would be the solution of the algorithm if we assume that the variables are free. So for the red line, we just run the algorithm, but with the complex uh, equation. The one I have written in the one part. And as we see, the matrices are not free in, in the cases we have chosen there. We have cooked matrices to, to, to not be free. Okay, so we see that in red, we have something which is uh, smoother because being free uh, turns to smooth uh, the spectrum. And with, when we go over the diagonal, we can look at something which is uh, much singular. Okay. And as you see, you have a, a recipe, you have an algorithm, which is the same as usual, but with different objects. Are there any questions about this? What? No, it's not free. You see, the, it, it is quite similar on this part, but here uh, you, you're not right. But, but there is a phenomenon in this example that could be explained is why those the two curves uh, only differ after this point. I don't know. And it's tricky to consider this. I just consider a model where I know that they are not unitary invariant and I cook them so that it is a bad situation. It's not a GUE. It's a GUE with a variance profile in this case. And in the article, the, the models are uh, specified. If you take a GUE, it will be free with everything. So it, when I, it is written GUE, there is a parameter GUE, which is actually a variance profile that make a percolation, if I remember well. I removed a lot of entries. So it's, it's a GUE with a variance profile, actually. And here we have a... Uh, Bernoulli matrices. We have matrices Cook from the uh, FFT uh, matrix, the fast Fourier transform matrix. We have different examples. We have a, a, a Brownian motion from a permutation matrix to a unitary matrix. So we just just look at different examples where uh, 
it is clearly not free, but free over the diagonal. I don't know. It's quite mysterious. Why does the diagonal play a specific role for permutation in round matrices? I would be happy to 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 hear an, an heuristic that explains this, but I don't know it. Yes, yeah. Um, so just to be sure I'm, I understand the algorithm. So it's just a uh, 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 don't break a second mic. So you you need to first compute the so the equation for the the implicit equation for the air transform. Uh -huh. so it's, in a, it's a vectorial equation because both matrices are diagonal, but it's a, a large n equation. So when you do the fixed point, I think in, so finding the air transform for each lambda must be uh, difficult. No, uh, it's uh, time consuming for your computer because you have a, if you have a matrices of size one thousand, it is a vector equation between vectors of size one thousand. Yeah, and you need to do it for every lambda. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For every yeah. So, yeah, so there is another question: is how to make this algorithm efficient? Yes. Clearly, I'm not uh, the guy who will be able to answer this question. So, but because of course you have to. Then what you want to to get is the uh, transform uh, the stages transform in the classical sense, because you know that if you have this object, you draw the density by taking minus imaginary part divided by pi. Okay, so here you have a recipe to have this big object, but don't forget that the air transform of a matrix, the, sorry, the stages transform can be uh, recovered thanks to this guy by taking the expectation of the normalized trace of this generalized stages transform apply in the matrix lambda identity. And actually what you want is uh, X plus a small uh, parameter for any x on your line and for any x you must run the, uh, the algorithm so it will be a lot of computation but at least if you're patient or if you have a big computer uh, you will get the solution yes the mic So you need to solve it for, let's say, pick n thousand, right? But if you solve for n thousand and n like thousand and one, there's no should be no much difference in the solution in the in the curve, right? Like, is there some limiting? Like, I mean, do you can you solve it just for n ten, for example, or the error will be very big? Or... Oh, but in general, you don't choose the size of your matrices if you have uh, one thousand stocks in your market and you want to consider one thousand stocks and you want to reduce it you will probably have data which is not a, a random matrix from a model but a true on a, a true matrix given by your uh, your modeling problem yeah, but i thought in free probability it only holds in the limit that for very large and absolutely and very large for a free limit in the nice sense can be 20. for for matrices of size 20 you will see that are almost free, uh -huh. actually. Here, you will need to reach a uh, higher bound, of course, because it's need more, uh, there are less randomness. So the convergence towards the free object over the diagonal is much slower. Okay. Estimating here, I'm not talking about how can we estimate the error between uh, the two elements. And that's an open problem in this general context. Okay. But, uh... So I cannot say you, you, sh you must take uh, matrices of this size to have such an error because I don't have this estimate. What I have is just uh, an evidence that if I take one single matrix and one single matrix, I have nice pictures. And actually, this fact 
is not the one that we predict because we predict things in, a, in average. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be true uh, point-wise, almost surely. Oh, I, well, I don't know if it's true, but we have the evidence that in this uh, context, it is uh, efficient. Uh, okay. But so I don't understand that you said for, for small n, like 1,000, you... So in free probability, you don't compute it for some fixed and you still like stages transform you only work in the in the so let me introduce a concept i think it will be useful to uh, pursue this discussion so here i have an approximate symbol what does that mean it means that in the limits we have the free object but you usually in application you don't have a sequence of uh, matrices whose size goes to infinity you have a fixed matrix so what you introduce is what is called a deterministic equivalent. Imagine Xn is a GUE matrix with a variance profile. You will have an approximation of this R matrix. And if I have time, I will give the expression. Okay. What you introduce is the guy who is the exact solution of this guy, of this equation. For your matrices, you know that it is only approximate. But so this is not exactly the still just transform over the diagonal of your sum, it is what is called a deterministic equivalent. A deterministic equivalent means that it is actually the still just transform of the sum of two operators, not matrices, but operators, where this guy has the same distribution as the finite size matrix, as well this guy has the distribution of the finite size matrix, but they belong in a space of infinite dimension where they are exactly free over the diagonal. For your matrices, they have this exact distribution, but they are just approximately free over the diagonal. And then what you want to do, if you want to have quantitative estimate, is to estimate the difference, let's say, in norm between the deterministic equivalent and your still just transform over the diagonal. You want to estimate the, the true xn plus yn minus the g tilde. In the definition g tilde, this is just a notation. And it doesn't depend on the sum. It depends on xn. It depends on yn. But here, you want to have an estimate. And if you can do that, it will be much uh, more powerful than just what I have uh, presented. But if you don't care about uh, proving estimate and just want an algorithm, you have all the ingredients. OK, does it clarify what you, you need? You know, you can use the free probability setting of large n limits just to have the tool, but at the end, you have finite size matrices, and the recipe is to, on the language, is to use this deterministic equivalent. Okay, so I have uh, seven minutes to talk about uh, outliers, so maybe it's uh, a bit. Uh... So I will ask my questions after. Huh? I can ask my questions at the end then. Oh, no, well, we can just keep this part and answer questions, no? No, uh, I think the answer is no, but for example, in the examples that you cooked here, uh, is it uh, not the case that you can find uh, free matrices such that there are some would construct this weird spectra there? Again, you can cook like like here. You 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 selected specific matrices which are uh, not free, uh -huh. so that you get this weird spectra, right? Which yeah. enter in which are described by. Uh, and actually, it's quite complicated because often you expect they are not free, but uh, they turns out to, to be free. But yes, yeah. Like, is it possible to show that you cannot find a pair of free matrices whose sum gives you the same uh, spectra? You cannot find a, a pair of free matrices. A pair where? of matrices such as if you sum them, the resulting matri matrix has this spectra in blue, which, is, which would then be described by free probability. But if you have three matrices, the blue and the red will coincide. Yes. Uh, it's not obvious, but. No, so then my question is can you find a pair of free matrices such that? you would get this blue line and the red line matching. Yes, if you take a GUE and an arbitrary matrices, 
So they will be both free and free over the diagonal. No, no, no I understand, no, but for these specific cases. I mean, these specific cases, they are not free. Yes, but could you find a pair of free matrices? A new pair of matrices? By picking like this and another one? Uh, no. I think I don't understand. I have, uh, in each case, I have a pair of matrices. So when you... Yeah, but let's say you have... So this pair of matrices are not free. Yeah. So that's why you have a mismatch between the blue exactly. and the... Now take... Can you... Could you construct a pair of free matrices? Mm -hmm. Another picture? Yes. But whose eigenvalue density would end up being the blue curves there? Or it's clear that you Okay, cannot... okay. So here, the blue line is the spectrum of a sum of yes. the three over the diagonal guys. Exactly. Can I discover exactly the same spectrum? For... Yes. What I have, now I will give you a trivial answer. You take the first matrix whose spectrum is this one, and you add a zero. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are free. No, no, I don't know. I'm not sure that I can answer positively your question. Okay. That's a good, uh, yeah, the, very nice. That's yeah, the very good answer. Is, uh, uh, freeness is regular, yeah, regular that's true, yeah. a lot. So you will probably not get something uh, which is weird like this. Yes. T I discovered yesterday that the free convolution gets you always the same kind of edge uh, decay in many, many. But you, you see that on yeah. the Swift curve. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so there is not so much. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not obvious because there are some singularities. But, yeah, yeah, so probably uh, not the case. Yeah. In any case, it's much smoother. And a uh, second comment, which uh, is uh, probably nonsense, but so we went from a theory of uh, freeness whose amalg amalg amalgation relations were in terms of scalar quantities, oui. and we can describe these free matrices. So here we are at the next level. You can describe a broader set of matrices. Uh, and the amalgamation is in terms of uh, vectors whose size is now the size of the diagonal of these matrices. Uh -huh. So if you extrapolate, you, you may think, is there a kind of even larger theory where amalg amalgamation would be between matrices? Right. But then, then, then at the end, it would not probably get anything used, it would be as hard as solving the direct problem, right? Or... No, there is a, an angle where you simplify things still, but you will have a matrix equation. Yeah. So if you look at the work of Erdos, Erdos is uh, actually uh, with his group uh, in Vienna, working with his uh, vector on the matrix Dyson equation, which is just another name for the subordination property, it is equivalent. Just that if it's not considering uh, uh, matrix parameters, only uh, complex, par uh, complex parameter here, but still taking the diagonal or taking the full matrix. Mm -hmm. And still it's giving you something. There is a subordination property of the level of matrices, which is useful. Mm -hmm. And actually yesterday, uh, Mark Potters talked about this to talk about these uh, uh, eigenvectors problems or outliers uh, uh, okay. localization. And this is what I would have explained if I had time. Let me just show the idea or remind uh, what Mark said, but at the level of uh, freeness over the diagonal. So let's say that this Xn is a variance profile GUI matrix. If you take the expectation of the resolvent, not the diagonal, not the trace. I'm taking expectation, but I'm in the world of the GUE, so I have a, a concentration. And so this day I take expectation, whereas I told you don't take the, take the expectation in the general case. In the GUE, you can do that. Then this guy is actually close to the resolvent of Y applied in another uh, parameter. Uh, that uh, I call omega, which depends on the model, where the omega lambda is this uh, lambda minus the air transform of xn applied in this guy. No, not in this guy, in the diagonal of the resolvent, in this guy. 
g of xn plus one. So this is not exactly your question. This is a receipt to have uh, the outliers, but it shows you that at some point, this subordination property, it, it's very similar. It's not true only for the Stilges transform, but it is true at some point for the resolvent itself. The only thing that we have mentioned yesterday is that this approximation is not so true uh, uniformly in the operator norm. It is true entry-wise for the matrices, which means that if you take the deterministic equivalent defined in the same way, you won't be, uh, you, you don't want to uh, control the norm of this generalized resolvent minus the norm of the deterministic equivalent, you will not converge to zero. But if you take this guy and uh, take the scalar product between two vectors, you will have a good approximation. Is it what people, is it related to this literature on uh, local laws? Alors, local laws is more about, so it's different, let me uh, explain this. At the level of the Stilges transform of Stilges transform over the diagonal, what is a local law? Let's say we have a parameter lambda or lambda identity. A local law is an estimate which holds when lambda can be uh, small in, when n goes to infinity. And uh, a strong local law is when you get the, the, the good estimate where you have the, the best rate of convergence for lambda. Why is it important? Is it because when you want to write the density, to, to get the density from the Stilges transform, you must take for a point x, some x plus a little uh, complex parameter. So if you make this parameter as small as possible, you'll get something much more precise. Or in another way, when you're doing the Stilges transform, it is a, um, a convolution with the Cauchy distribution. So if you're uh, too small, you have this, which is not a good approximation. If you're too large, you have something which is too uniform. And local law means I find the good uh, rate of convergence to have something which is as close as possible to the real density. So proving the local law is like the next step. First step is proving that in some average, in some, in some way we have this approximation or in the limit, we can describe the, we have a limiting object for which we have the spectrum uh, which coincide with the limit. But local law is making a, a precise estimate. And this is quite difficult. This is what we do in, uh, with Bigo, with Jeremy Bigo for this uh, outliers problem and we don't do uh, we don't write uh, a strong local law because it's not optimal mm. because it's a bit uh, difficult and technical for us but still we have a method which in practice i'll show you very nice uh, uh, estimation of a tire but cor correct me if i'm wrong but at least in Wigner matrices and quite generic type of Wigner matrices the local law holds even at the scale one over n so yeah, yeah, yeah. one over n plus something plus a little uh, eta for any eta positive you mean it's not exactly one over n it's uh, if i remember it's true for one over n plus eta for any eta positive yeah okay but you are at the scale of the eigenvalues essentially you need yes you have you just have to avoid to be in this situation and just uh, slightly slower than one over n works yeah okay Okay, so we, we, it's uh, over. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to present this work. And, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Hello, I have a question uh, by Monday Adia. Please, the second method you talk about, can it still arrive at the output you explain? Uh, I'm a bit confused about the question, so. So if you can specify a little bit the question, I will be happy to answer it, but uh, I apologize, I'm not really understanding. Alors, so do we have something more? Okay.